afternoon everyone from uh, the online and from uh, this room. Okay, welcome to the session 6 for the section of the theme of uh, pedagogy learning approaches and uh, instructional design. Okay, my name is Tim Chai Santi, I'm the chair of uh, this session. Uh, we have two full papers and three short papers. And uh, two full papers, uh, we have uh, 20 minutes each, and for the short paper, we have 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, shall we start from the first paper? Okay. This paper title How to Evaluate Games in Education uh, Literature Review. Uh, the presenter will be uh, Julio Barbaro. Okay, please. Thank you very much. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm somebody who tends to walk <laughs> when I present. Um, so, uh, my name is Julio Barbaro. I'm a teaching PhD at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, as most of you, can see from this, this is going to be about a literature review that instinctively comes to say, ah, boring. And trust me, I understand that after writing one. Uh, the literature review, this one in particular, started because I was really wondering, as part of my PhD, before I continue to do research on this too much, are games in education effective? Because if they are not, then my PhD doesn't make much sense, so I should probably change now. And uh, uh, if you ever researched around this topic, you realize there is a massive number of research being done right now. Uh, the number of uh, um, experiments involving games has exponentially grown through the years and has now reached like the same level of, uh, of papers every year. So, it is very difficult to answer this question. Generally, going through a bunch of paper, I normally realize there are three main categories of results. The first one is the one we all, that we work in the field, expect, right? They decide, yes, they work, they're amazing, the motivation is great, the results are fantastic. It's not necessarily the most common. Uh, I think one of the most common is the central approach, that it's, they work for motivation. The final results are usually the same as normal education. Now, let's consider the fact that already working for motivation is a very big deal. Like, we don't necessarily need to achieve better results if we have our students be more motivated. And then there is a category, of course, that says, no, it doesn't work particularly, they achieve worse results than the normal group. Like this. And it is actually a, a pretty also decent number of studies who found this. So, in order to try to uh, understand a little bit why there were so many different results, I started to go through all the papers and I realized there is a diversity of context that is huge when it comes to um, using games in education. There is a diversity of context, of course, of subjects. Games have been used for mathematics, they have been used for languages. Imagine all the experiments with gamification that are just on our phone, for example. Uh, who here does not do Duolingo, for example? That's a prime example of uh, gamification. And then there is also diversity that is very important. It's about didactics. That, like, that is very, very important because how we teach all around the world even the same subject is very different. And when we apply a game on it, well, that is very important to keep in mind that the original version of that course, the non-game one, it's also already very diverse. So this brings to uh, this question being quite complicated to answer, I would say. Uh, in general, what I was trying to achieve First was a comparative approach. So I have many different papers. Uh, I make here two examples that I, I make up, but I, they pro you probably could find them somewhere for sure. Here we could have an experiment trying to teach equations, so math, uh, using a badges system. It's a great classic, the badges are there everywhere now. And another one, they could try to teach, for example, functions, Python functions. Uh, using a leaderboard system, so trying to enhance competition. Hmm? Now, are the two experiments even comparable? And if they are, how can we compare them? Now, in order to be able to compare these two experiments, 
we need to take into consideration two main categories, two main uh, uh, questions. One is, are the subjects comparable? Are we confident that uh, using the game in, like in the, in the example before, mathematics is in general the same as using it in computer science education? And the second one is, are the teaching styles, so the, the way the control groups are taught, hmm? so the normal non-gamified version, are they also comparable? Are they also taught in the same way? Now, for the first question, we can have a comparative approach. We can collect studies, we can check different subjects, and check the results of these studies and see which subjects, for example, are more, are more successful than others. And then we can draw conclusions from that. Now, the second question, the second question was funny. The second question, I realized after reading two articles that I would have not got any answer from that. Why? Because many articles and experiments involving gamification make it very difficult to retrieve how was the subject taught originally. This information is often very reduced and very vague. So, for the second question, I had to step, take a step back. I had to take a step back in the sense that instead of going so much about um, the way the control group was taught, I first wanted to check how clear are experiments involving gamifications and game-based learning about how the control group was taught. How much information can we actually retrieve? Could we even have a comparable approach here? So the two research questions that I arrived to it, the first one is exactly as I stated at the beginning, more about the subject and how the subject influences the effectiveness of game-based learning and gamification. For this specific study, I'm putting them together because it's very difficult to divide them also um, in a literature review. And the second one is how clearly the characteristics of the control group are described. So, in particular, I focus on the teaching method. So, the students, how are they taught? The teaching material. What did the professor use for the teaching material? Did he use PowerPoint? Did he, did he use videos? Did he use, for example, when I teach programming, I use a lot of live coding. I almost use no slides. And finally, the testing method. I call it testing method because that's just fair. It will be the evaluation normally. How are the students evaluated? In this case, we are talking about experiments, so that's a testing method. So, the overall method of this research is to, first of all, of course, collect the studies. We collect the studies, we identify what is the subject of each of these studies, then we try to rate the clarity of the three categories that I described before, right? Um, the clarity is a very vague term, like how do we define clarity? Uh, probably there is, you would have to make a whole other research to define that. I personally decided that these are experiments, so is the experiment replicable with that information? Yes or no? Could I replicate the experiment? After that we try to identify the results, so how did the experiment work? Did it work well? So we had an effect in which the game group performed better or mixed, so they are the same. Or negative, so the game group performed worse than the control group. Hmm? Notice here that I excluded motivation. Now, as I said before, motivation is really important, but motivation, we can already de delineate that games help in motivation. I don't want to say we already know that, but many studies seem to lead towards that. Performance is what is more debated right now. After that, we cluster the subjects, we, can, we check and we analyze uh, all the results and the performance of these experiments, and we try to draw conclusions from them. Okay. So, first of all, this is a literature review, right? So, the first thing you have to do is to try to define the context of these papers, right? Uh, you cannot take on them. You cannot take all of them because there is a massive amount and it becomes more and more difficult to compare. So my first fault was to limit myself to the scientific context. I want to know different scientific disciplines, how do they influence the effect of games in teaching them. 
Um, on the last second part, uh, I have to think if we, were, if we were talking more about academic theoretical subjects, we were talking about training skills, or we were talking about both. I decided to include all of them. I decided to include all of them because there are subjects such as medicine, in particular the life sciences, in which it's very difficult to define something as theoretical or practical. They are often very, very closely knit together. Um, high school or university, that was a choice that was related to the fact that primary schools tend to be uh, way less unified. They tend to be all around the world uh, more autonomous in the way they teach. So it would be very difficult to define what subject is this. High school of universities, they tend to be more divided all around the world in traditional disciplines, with some exceptions, of course. They have to be controlled studies. That, that is obvious if not all of this wouldn't work. Um, and they involve digital applications. I use this just in order to exclude board games, for example, because I decided to focus on video games and it would be very complicated again to include the board games in this case. Now this is the more technical part of the <laughs> literature review, so the, the search criteria. Um, well, you can see serious game, game based gamification and game elements. In general, I try to involve almost everything in the world of games, and then I proceeded with experiment evaluation, impact outcomes, etc. Uh, we use the Leiden University Library Database. It was easy to access and it has a very big amount of uh, um, articles. We started from 2013 to 2020. This because there is already some literature review, not doing the same, but involving in any way an overall overlook of like how games are used in experiments uh, until 2013. But because there, was, there has been this massively exponential growth, I decided that to check from 2013 to 2020. Uh, 2020, 2023, that's how long it took to actually analyze everything, basically. Uh, it had to be in English, because <laughs> that, that made sense. And uh, we went through the first 100 entries ordered by relevance, and we collected those, and then we checked. Yes. We checked and we went through our criteria to select them. The final selection is a selection of 43 studies. Um, we can already see from the average publication date that the exponential growth of this is confirmed because 2013, 2020, the average publication year is already 2018. That's how exponential the growth has been and is being for now. The majority is in the art sciences, but there are many also in the life sciences. Eh? Uh, social sciences, a little bit fewer, which is quite a surprise to be honest, but I guess that their massive use that they do in psychology or sociology with games doesn't mean that they, do, they use them to teach sociology and psychology. Now, the result. Uh, this is for the first question. How does the subject influence the results? Um, I'm sorry if it's not really readable, like, it's very, I try to fit as much as I can. Um, we can see that there is, the hard science success rate, it's mixed, right? 10 out of 18, that's not really, like, necessarily great. Uh, engineering is doing better, even though with the sample rate of 4, I don't know how much we can conclude. Life science, they have the worst success rate, 5 out of 14. Mm -hmm. The overall success rate is 21 out of 43. Please do consider though, that this success rate involves the successful one. So there has been an effect on performance in the game group. It doesn't involve necessarily the ones that had only mixed um, effect, right? So maybe an effect on motivation, but not real effect between the two groups. So this actually is a pretty decent result for gamification and game-based education. Um, then, when it comes to the clarity, in the clarity it has like, uh, it's confirming results of uh, older studies that they found already, like this lack of clarity in the description of the experimental and control conditions. So, um, when it comes to the testing, as we can expect, they were clearer, because it's an experiment, so you have to explain how you test the participants. But when it came to the uh, teaching method and the teaching material, in particular the method has been unclear in the majority of the cases. Mm -hmm. 
so 30 out of 43. The teaching material instead, it's almost comparable, but still mostly unclear. Now, this is not surprising because it's all, oh, how many times we have found it difficult to understand how was the subject taught in a paper. The material, they tend to explain it more. So now it comes to the discussion, how does the context, uh, the context of application influence the results? Generally, subjects involved in technology, so computer science, but even engineering, they tend to be more successful. Another thing I notice is that subjects with a strong practical component, therefore the life sciences, as I said before, they also tend to fail more often in uh, using games. How clearly are the control group activities described? Well, that one I would say not necessarily clearly. There is a tendency to overlook uh, the teaching method and the teaching material. And uh, um, normally I would try to analyze how these two uh, components are then described. If they are not described at all, then how are they mentioned? There are two main groups. One of them simply doesn't mention them. There is a control group, and we move on, and that's it. Another group uses very vague terms. I think that uh, I'm quoting almost directly, not saying the article because it sounds rude, but it's traditional teaching methods, which mean nothing. Like, I have no idea what a traditional teaching method is in a, for a, uh, any specific country. Testing method are often clearer, but again, there is a bias here because we're talking about experiments. So obviously, they're probably going to be clearer. Now, um, sorry, I think what is interesting here to discuss is to conclude a little bit what can we say about this. So for the first part of the subjects involved in technology, we might say that probably subjects in which students are already more aligned and interested into technological applications, they can find video games more effective. There could be a component of that. I think the most interesting one and the one that has the most solid research, background research about it is the second point. So there has been already some research that shows, for example, that in VR applications, but also in video games, the transferring of practical skills is not as immediate and easy as we think. There has been a lot of research also that uh, I know in, in Leiden, for example, using the VR, in which it notices that people were not really able to transfer the skills that they practiced in the virtual reality into the real world. And I think here we are assisting to something similar, in which in the life sciences, in which they have to, sure, lear learn how, for example, um, CPR works, for example, but then they have to practice it they are not acquiring the skills as well as the group that doesn't use the game but does it practically. So that, it's not completely surprising. For the, uh, right? And we're back. So for the second part, I would say that in general, um, there is a lack because there is a lack of categorization. We struggle to categorize how do we teach how do we, what material we use, what method we use, there are no categories for that generally accepted. So people tend to basically skip that. Uh, now, of course, this approach, this whole experiment comes with limitations. And limitations are, of course, the first one is the selection criteria. And that's probably natural for any literature review. There is a selection criteria that is only for scientific so topics. With that, we are excluding, for example, all the applications used to learn languages, for example, all the humanities. So there might be still a big difference between scientific subjects and humanities here. And this, and this article doesn't take that into consideration. The second is the concept of success rate. I know we would, might think that that's more objective, but it's actually not, because it depends a lot on the scope of the paper. There are papers who could entirely focus just on motivation. There are other papers who actually did full-on qualitative research. Qualitative research, how you define a success, it's much more difficult than quantitative research in which you have a numerical success. So that's also something to take into consideration. And the last one, I think it's the biggest limitation, is the fact that clarity is a subjective term. What do we define as clear? 
we can go through all the processes we want, but in the end of the game, we are always going to try to use a method that it's debatable you know, on some aspects. So there is definitely um, an issue there. Now, for future work, what I think would be interesting is, of course, there are two main approaches. The first one is we formalize what we define as clarity, right? Good luck with that. Like that's going to be very tough, and it's going to be a lot of work to define some to try to formalize the idea of clarity. Now, there is another approach that is to basically circumvent the need to compare the control groups. So to develop tools to compare experimental conditions directly without comparing the control groups. Uh, so we are not comparing the intervention anymore, we are not comparing the difference between the control group and the experimental group, but we are comparing the experiments, the, the games, directly. And this is very interesting for, ga for game research, to be honest. Now, there are several ways that we are already thinking about what to do. Uh, I think here, by the way, there are some of the references that I used for this presentation, of course, in the literature review, I didn't put all of them because it would be too much. Um, in general, there are already, we're already thinking about some methods of, that would allow us to um, categorize the several elements that come in a video game or in a gamified uh, environment. In particular, we're thinking about the game design patterns. That's a great classic that has been also quite honestly criticized in a, under many aspects as an analysis tool, but in this case I think it would be useful to try to define what are the elements of game, the single individual components that are applied in each experiment, and how successful the experiment is. Can we compare? So, different uh, um, video games involving leaderboards, how successful they are. Different video games involving uh, resource uh, and uh, production uh, chains, how successful they are. But, of course, that's for future work, and it's a lot of work. Now, thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm here if you need any questions, if you have any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, can anyone have a question? Okay, yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have a question about, uh, about the definition of uh, K. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because my uh, colleague of the researcher is uh, doing about uh, game, so the definition of game is quite broad. So, uh, what what is this uh, definition of game on your research? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a good question, and it's a question that we are debating for a long time. Uh, I would say for this specific experiment, the simplified fact is that the articles themselves need to mention games. So, like, I kind of took a step back on the definition of game because they define the game, right? In general, I would say a definition that I find interesting but still with many limitations is that games are simulations with plus interactions and fun. Now there you're falling already in the big pitfall that what is fun? <laughs> so, also that it has very big limits. Um, I would say that for sure there is an element of interaction, there is an element of engagement. I would say that that is a better term than fun, it's more precise. So you have an interaction that engages you with that digital artifact. Again, also this probably has many limitations. Thank you. Any question or comments? Well, I'm not sure in online, I any question or not. On the graph of the success rate, there were like only 21 on their success rate, like back and back and back and back and back. Yeah, on the graph of the success rate, it was like overall success rate were only 21 out of 43, which is like 50%. Yeah. Like how, what should we imply that gaming is not like the best solutions or is this uncomparable or what do you think we could improve the success rate? Yeah, I, I think that there is a component that we could implant that. Again, this involves only the games that actually the, the game group did better than the normal group, but it doesn't involve the motivation aspect of it. So the motivation aspect is something that we have to consider, it's very valuable for our students, I would say. In general, that goes back to the first question, the big question, do are they effective? 
I would say this, and this is something that we can learn from this. Are they effective? Yes, in certain conditions and when designed with certain um, ideas in mind, with certain prerequisites that allows us to design meaningful game for the tool. Uh, what we see sometimes is that there are these experiments in which they try to use it more as a simulation and then these games are very, uh, for example, low quality, not in a, in a visual way. And they think that that doesn't interfere. Doesn't it though? In an in in a interruption in which there is a strong engagement, doesn't, for example, the quality of the visuals interfere with how much we are engaged to that uh, digital artifact? So I would say what we can learn from this is that Games need to be applied, it can be applied in education, can be effective if they are necessary and if they are designed sensibly towards that specific application in education. Thank you. Okay, any more comments or questions? Okay, I have just only a quick uh, question about that. Uh, actually, when I think about uh, games in education, I remind about like a more uh, like a lower level, like a kids or uh, primary school or elementary school, something like that. But uh, you're starting to use a uh, high school and university level, right? Yeah. Uh, what is your motivation on that? Why you didn't use uh, like a more lower level of kids? Because uh, I think that kids quite a bit for the uh, kind of school. Yeah, there is definitely uh, an aspect that it becomes because there is the aspect of motivation. And when you have the aspect of motivation for uh, uh, primary school, for example, it's very valuable to have the motivator, very valuable. So that's definitely in that aspect, yes. But you were focusing mainly on performance, right? And on subject. Now on subject, it becomes very difficult to do it on primary schools. Because primary schools, they tend to use games for behavioral change. Many of the work they do, they tend to be in between teaching skills, teaching knowledge, and behavioral change. And when you have behavioral change, that becomes very tricky to analyze in this specific context. I would say it's still very interesting. Uh, there should be another research very similarly done, but indicating the difference between behavioral change, um, knowledge, and uh, skills, or the mix of them. But again, with the primary school, it's more difficult to clearly distinguish what is the subject and everything, because every program tends to be very autonomous, at least in, the, in each country, I would say. So I kind of avoided it to avoid having to go through and try to check what should be included or not, because it probably would have been very difficult. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? And if no, thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Then, okay. Then next uh, we go to uh, the second papers. Uh, the second paper is the paper title: Does a team or individual performance contribute to solve complex problem? Okay. A case study on uh, active learning using a business simulation game. Right. Which you have my screen first. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Then uh, presenter will be uh, Sophie. Good afternoon, my name is Oli Yves. Today I'm going to present my topic, which is Does the team or individual performance continue to solve a complex problem? A case study on FTL learning using business simulation games. Okay, for the motivation for this study, so as we know that in one company, there are many departments such as sales departments, production department, and focus team department, and they also have the one objective of optimizing the profit. However, in achieving this uh, this goal, uh, they so the so they always have the problem that related to the communication and uh, collaboration. But in order to uh, solve this complex problem, we are not sure that thus we need one high IQ person or team to solve these complex problems. 
Next, please move to introduction. Uh, based on the complex problem that I talked in earlier, so we have been using one simulation game that we call ERP Sims. So as we know that ERP Sim is a kind of simulation game that we distribute the product into the regions, as so in this picture, and the responsibility of participants, they have to make the decision related to distribute this product, and all decision of participant would affect to the company profit, as shown in this slide. Next, for the problem statement, we want to observe how the team work to solve complex problems or real complex problem by using business simulation game, as I mentioned previous slide. Okay, for the research objective for this study, uh, we want to enhance participant for the first generation skill, including communication skill, collaboration skill, critical thinking, and reactivity through the playing business simulation game. And we want to explore how many factors, including individual level of intelligence, through the engagement, and team dynamic may influence the participant learning outcomes. Let's move to some quickly on literature review. Uh, for this literature, for literature reviews, I want to briefly explain what is the 21st century learning framework. For the 21st century learning framework, it's just like one framework that has five components. It has activity, problem solving, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. It considered is the best framework to prepare students before going to the actual workplace or before they graduate from the university. For the recent gap on this study, as we leave that authentic learning on problem learning and collaborative learning are very important for, for empowering student life skills and we also want to compare the distribution between individual and teamwork to the team performance and this study, we will use we use the qualitative observations research approach is one of uh, it's one of method that are that appropriate for addressing this above research question to get in depth understanding of the whole learning process. Let me let move to the methodology. Uh, for the first one, we have used the business simulation game as a tool to solve the complex problems by playing the two consecutive rounds with 20 minutes for each round. And after that, we divide the roles of participants during the games. And we also record the video. And lastly, during they play the game, we also do the research observation in real time in order to observe their behavior. Uh, for the business simulation workshop enhancing of organizational knowledge through the business game, we have conducted week six workshop in totally with 255 participants and the most majority of participants are high school students and we notice for the workshop or the number ones it has a one high school team from high school that we consider as a one high high school team because uh, they got a scholarship from Thai government to study in high school Okay, in order to accept the performance after they play the games, we will use the company profit uh, to evaluate their performance. Uh, like with the participant get the highest company profit, they will consider as a winning team and the lowest company profit as a losing team. And after that, for the collection stage, we record the video and audio we take in detail note and feedback from the student after they play the game. Okay, for the qualitative observation, uh, we have two authors with expert in qualitative research has been involved in this study. And after that, we move to data analysis stage. We have watched video many times and we also notice participant behavior during we watch the video. And after that, we have to implement implement it, the track the triangulation method for ensuring the identity and the activity in data analysis by cross check uh, 
between these two order, and after that we will use the thematic analysis to identify, to analyze, and interpreting the emergent theme. And we did not forget about to to implement the ethical consideration to to uh, in order to uh, give the right to all party that involved in the study. Okay, so after data analysis stage, we found uh, some behavior that align with the 21st century learning framework, such as they have the communication skill, they have the collaboration skill, they have the team flexibility. For the team flexibility is adapt and respond to check and challenge as a whole. They have the adaptability, they have the creativity, and also they open-minded between each member in the team. And for team autonomy, we, uh, it is a kind of behavior of the team that uh, level of freedom of team member as a whole, they can make decision and they also self management and critical thinking and the activity. And we also uh, got some individual behavior like uh, they have problem solving, they have in deep, like they have individual IQ or leadership style. Let's move to the result and discussion of our research. For the first result, we found that individual high IQ did not affect the team in business simulation game. Why? Because during they play the game, they left the communication with each other. They also left the collaboration. And at that time, we conduct in the COVID-19 pandemic. And they also have the technology and social barrier in online learning environment during the COVID-19 pandemic would affect to the lowest performance of their team. And the second finding, we found that clear communication and high collaboration skill lead to team success as we observed with the two, with the two other. So we found that the key team behavior of all the six workshops, they have the good communication and good collaboration. And for this line, I will talk so this table is show about between the behavior between the highest performing team and lowest performing team and highest performing team and lowest perform lowest performing team. It has content with the two behavior, individual and team behavior. And the last finding, we found that half the business simulation have developed the 21st century skill. For the first point is critical thinking. In the business simulation game, it has one function that allows participants to do critical thinking before making the decision to change the price list of the product. And the second point is problem solving and creativity. The business simulation game has some data to provide to participants to create visualization tool to support decision making and lastly is collaboration and communication as uh, during the game the team was given ten minutes to discuss with each other to find the strategy how to win the games let's move to the conclusion in the conclusion we found that individual high IQ is less significant predictor of team success if you compare with the effective communication and collaborative within a team. And the results show that the potential of the business simulation gap in developing the 21st general learning skills through providing an authentic and enriching learning content for the participant. And lastly, the business simulation gap support each team member in nurturing the ability to remain flexible and autonomous during the team work. And this is our reference, and also it is my research teams. Yeah, so my research team is Ajahn Chaudhary. And thank you for your attention. If you have any question, okay. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Okay. How do you make sure they're collaboration? 
Yeah, so like we make sure by watching the video, you know, so like, uh, so us. So as we mentioned, so as I mentioned, that uh, we conduct with six order, which six workshop. So it's mean that at the time we also record the video. So during they play the game, and then to analyze the communication or anything, we have to watch video to find the behavior. You know, so we have to spend a lot of time to watch the video, and then we take a note about the behavior, and then we can uh, say that oh, they have the good communication. Yeah, so we have to watch the video and then so we just, uh, so we have to identify that we have. Hmm? Yeah, so like uh, for the qualitative observation, we have to watch the video and then we just identify uh, the behavior, but in order to make sure that we have to discuss with the two authors that I mentioned earlier, and then we found it all. Oh, yeah, so the team have the communication or something like that. So for this reason, it's not the quantitative, it's the qualitative, it's different. Yeah, so I think like for example, for the first workshop, right, uh -huh. we have a team so that they play the game. Uh -huh. And then so it's mean that so they have to play the game and then so as I mentioned, they have to play two rounds. For each round it's twenty minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. Yeah. So twenty minutes for each round and then for one minute is equal to one day. So because we play twenty minutes, so it's equal to twenty days. And uh, can, can you uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the uh, experiment result? Mm -hmm. I would like to know that uh, when comparing between uh, the high performance of individual group, uh, of individual and high performance of a group, what is the gap? Do you have it? Or the low performance of an individual and low performance of a group? What is the gap? Do you have this kind of uh, result? You mean this table, right? Yeah, yeah, but this one uh, you try to uh, identify, identify so between uh, individual and uh, uh, team. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that means uh, if I want to see the high uh, performance of individual and team, that means uh, the, the left side, right? Yeah, so, so it's mean that for the highest uh -huh. performance team and then so uh -huh. the under uh, highest performance team, so yeah. you have like one row is individual behavior, so it represent for the highest performance uh -huh. team. How, how, how are the gap between this group? Yeah, so for the individual, so for example, uh -huh. so as we play the game, right? Uh -huh. So we play in the team, uh -huh. but uh, we identify into two behavior. The first behavior is individual, and the second is team behavior. Yeah, for, for individual, we have to identify for each member individual. Yeah, for the team behavior, we identify as a team behavior. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will just... No, no, I have a quick question. Did you notice any effect on the size of the team? Like, depend, like... Oh, yeah. So, good question. Uh, so far, the size of the team, right? So, for the size of the team, we uh, have to measure by one to nine people per team. Yeah. And bigger teams, they were able to communicate as well as smaller teams? Yeah, so I think uh, the part of the team first, so you know like the workshop or the one, so it has one team that they got the scholarship from the Thai government and then we thought that, oh, they were the, so they are the high IQ students. Yeah, but, but after they play the game, they lost the game. You know, because they don't have the communication and anything, so we need a team. Okay, and one, uh, I just want to know 
Yeah, so for the business simulation game, right, we use the ERP SIM, but yeah, for the ERP SIM is kind of the enterprise resource planning system game. So it means that we play by distribute the SIM, the product into the region in one country, which is Germany, and then we have three, we have three region, west, south, and north. And then uh, for the participant, you know, so when they play the game, they have to make decision how they distribute this product into this this region, and then uh, for distribute this product, uh, so they so they have for first round they have uh, two function. We call the cell process. For the cell process, it have two function. It change price list of the product, and the and the next function is marketing. You know, yeah. Set in marketing, so for the first round, but for the second round, we move to the production or anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, okay then the next uh, presentation will be uh, online presentation. Uh, it will be uh, the title of Optimizing Learning Outcome and Retention in MOOCs. With AI generated fresh card. Uh, Jonas, Aziz, Bashiri, are you here? Can you say something? Hello, people oh, are looking okay. here. Hello, everyone are looking uh, for your presentation. Uh, okay, now, it's please, we have 20 minutes. Yeah. 20 minutes really in code yeah. uh, QA for you. Okay, yes, please. It's an honor to be here today. It's the seventh international conference. My name is Ines Adil and I have the privilege of working on a fascinating project that which the world of artificial intelligence. Excuse my English because it's my third language, so thank you. the sound, uh, can you uh, open uh, the volume, make it louder? Oh, I'm not sure that the... Uh, oh. Maybe uh, you need to uh, click for sharing sound, for share the sound. Okay, uh, can, I, can I share the, uh, the link on YouTube? Sure. <laughs> Can you click on the link, please? Contribution of this study. 
Our work has been conducted at the Laboratory of Mathematics Innovation and Information Technology at Sultan Bessima University in Benilla, Morocco. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizer for providing this platform, for knowledge sharing and collaboration. Our study is titled Optimizing Learning Outcomes and Retention in MOOCs with AI-generated flashcards. Our work seeks to reshape the landscape of online learning by harnessing the potential of advanced AI techniques. Thank you for your attention and let's dive into the details of this exploration. Our presentation meticulously follows a structured roadmap. The journey commences with the background segments, providing essential context. Progressing, we delve into the literature survey to assimilate existing knowledge. The methodology elucidates our innovative AI approach followed by the experiments that gauge our methods impact. Results and discussions showcase enlightening outcomes and conclusion outfully conclude our journey. Let's begin by acknowledging that sorry popularity of massive open online course for MOOCs as a remarkable tool for distance learning. However, one of the most significant challenges faced by MOOCs learner is the daunting task of retaining and recalling the vast amount of course content. This is where flashcards come into play. Flashcards have proven to be an effective self-assessment and revision tool in traditional education. They are akin to a cognitive workout, promoting the testing effects and capitalizing uh, on the principle of spaced repetition. However, generating high-quality flashcards from the diverse and voluminous course material offered by MOOCs has remained a formidable challenge. In response to this challenge, our research introduces a novel method that leverages the powerful capabilities of natural language processing or NLP to create high quality flashcards automatically from MOOCs content. Uh, this innovative approach holds the promise of uh, extending the learning experience, boosting memory retention, and ultimately transforming the landscape of online education. Our survey focused on vocabulary learning and recall techniques, digital flashcard tools, and AI-powered question generation. Table 1 focuses on research related to vocabulary learning and recall techniques. The studies presented in this table explore the effectiveness of traditional paper flashcard, augmented reality AR flashcard, and online vocabulary flashcard with science. The findings demonstrate how these tools can significantly enhance vocabulary learning, especially in early childhood education and language recall scenarios. These studies highlight strategies to improve sight word recognition, fluency, and vocabulary recall, draw innovative methods, emphasizing the importance of flashcards in educational settings. Table 2 highlights research related to the use of educational tools and technology, particularly the utilization of digital flashcards in various educational contexts. The studies in this table discuss the potential of mobile flashcard application in promoting mobile learning, especially through the introduction of Ars Nova cards. Additionally, the table includes the research on the use of flashcards and smart boards to improve long-term knowledge retention, particularly in special areas such as 
for clinical knowledge and studies emphasize the role of technology enhanced learning tools in enhancing educational experiences. Table 3 explores research at the intersection of artificial intelligence, AI, and question generation techniques. The studies in this table showcase the, the application of AI-powered methods to enhance students' engagement and assess participants in massive open online courses, MOOCs. The development of systems that utilize deep learning, such as the use of T5 models for question answering, demonstrates the potential of AI in educational setting. The studies also address the, uh, the basin of question answering models and the generation of mutual questions using question answering as a constraint. These advancements underscore the growing role of AI in transforming the online learning experience. Now, let's dive into the core of the methodology of the research emphasizing a meticulous approach to understand our AI-generated flashcard framework. Our research commences with the collection of course scattered from the MOOC titled MPPBIE encompassing eight modules with multiple classes using the Python library Beautiful Soup with carefully extract lesson title, description and content which are organized in a structured JSON repository. The subsequent phase involves pre-processing to ensure clarity and coherence. We undertake tasks such as HTML tag removal, elimination of space short characters, and judicious punctuation refinement, tokenization that segments the text into coherent sentences. Additional step encompass lemmatization and part of speech tagging, refining the text further. Leveraging hacking face transformers, we employ the T5 model, fine-tuned for our specific task, including question generation. Our methodology involves two core aspects, question generation QG and question answering QA. QG employ the T5 based model pre-trained on Squad 2.0 to craft relevant questions. Completing this, QA employ pre-trained Roberta based Squad 2 to address question answering. The combination of the question generation and the answering form the core of our flashcard generation pipeline ensuring the creation of comprehensive and effective flashcards from the rich low content. Additionally, as an integral part of our methodology, the generated flashcards are delivered in format CSV format. This format accommodates uh, compatibility with various learning management system LMS uh, flashcard plugins. And the most popular standalone flashcard application available in the market. This ensures the accessibility and versatility of the, our AI generated flashcard, catering to a wide range of educational platforms and preferences. With our AI generated flashcard in hand, it was time to assess their quality to ensure a pro uh, evaluation. We engaged 50 students and 10 instructors for the MPBI MOOCs. Uh, these participants carefully selected from the larger pool of 780 enrolled students were introduced to our studies objectives and encouraged to use the AI generated flashcards as part of their learning experience. We designed an online survey to gather uh, detailed feedback 
from those students and instructors regarding the flashcards' utility relevance and overall quality. The survey encompasses a range of questions, each aimed at understanding the perception of our participants. Let's dive into the results of the flashcard quality evaluation. Instructor provided us with invaluable insights into the accuracy and fluency of the AI-generated flashcards. The table summarized the assessment for a selection of flashcards. The results indicate that, on average, the flashcard received an accuracy score of 4.1 showcasing their capability and effectively convey the course content. Additionally, the average fluency score of 4.2 reflects the readability and understandability of the flashcard. This score validates the potential of AI-generated flashcards as a valuable educational resource. Now, let's delve into the rich feedback we received from both students and instructors through the survey. Uh, this feedback provided us with insight into their perceptions, uh, shedding light on various dimensions of the flashcards, utility and impact. From the survey data, it is evident that the AI-generated flashcards were well received by both students and instructors. Most students reported prior experience with flashcards as a study tool, indicated uh, their familiarity with this effective learning technique. The student perceptions of the flashcards, helpfulness, relevance, and understandability were notably positive. Importantly, the data suggested that the flashcards played a significant role in any student's memory retention of the course material. An overwhelming majority of students expressed their readiness to recommend these AI-generated flashcards to their peer enrolled in the course. This high level of satisfaction regarding the quality, variety and usefulness of the flashcard underscore their potential to enhance the learning experience. And scripture echoed this sentiment providing an even stronger endorsement of the use of flashcards in the course. Their overall satisfaction with the flashcard's quality, variety and usefulness was also noteworthy. This paper presented the implementation of a flashcard board, a generative AI system utilizing natural language processing NLP and question generating. The survey results highlight an optimistic acceptance among learners strengthening the argument of AI's role in enhancing the online learning experience. While our method produces promising results, we recognize that there is room of further improvement as a pathway for more future research could delve deeper into more extensive application of generative AI in education, focusing on optimizing the model for hybrid learners' engagement and understanding. Before I conclude, I'd like to acknowledge the students and the instructors who participated in our study, as their feedback has been instrumental in shaping our research. Thank you for your time. I look forward for your insights and questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any question comments? Uh, first of all, uh, which subject that you use uh, in this uh, uh, experiment? 
Yes, uh, the, the project has seen substantial development since its inception. Initially, we started by generating this basic flash card using sample algorithm. However, we were progressive with incorporating more advanced NLP techniques uh, to generate flash cards. Our algorithm has been become more efficient at the uh, selling complex educational campus into Italy in the context of MOOC, there is a lot of data. So if the students can retain the most important things about all this, this massive that data with the name of massive open online courses, we, we can use educational, uh, you can use uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, large language models such as uh, ChatGPT, but ChatGPT, uh, we can use API, but we use the T5 based model, and it's a fully trained model that we, we, we fine tune for our, um, our uh, needs. We have three language in Moroccan books, we have Arabic language, we have Andalusian language, and also we have French and English language. So we have to, to, to have a, a model that we can fine tune it and uh, is based on a, a full trained model. Uh, an AI tutoring 
for students and to suit their, their needs and to not give a randomly uh, generated flashcard. It's to be a simple, more simple for, for students' needs. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, then, okay, thank you so, uh, for your presentation, then please go ahead to you. Okay, we go to uh, the next uh, presentation. Okay, the presentation is titled AR and VR Enhanced Learning. Uh, it will be presented by uh, Professor uh, Walala. Okay, please. Sorry, just read the sink. Yeah. Okay. Actually, on my paper, it's very easy and you know, like quite just something that you guys already know. This is about AR and VR enhancing learning. Thank you. Could be okay. So very much. This one. This one. See, it's easier to be shared than presenter. It's not moving at all. It's as how only 10 plus plus slides and it's uh, something that you guys already are familiar with that uh, I'm going to conclude things that we use AR augmented realities and virtual reality in terms of learning. You can stand here and flip the slide. Can okay. So I'm gonna stand here. I'm sorry. I'm gonna let you guys go back home soon. Promise. <laughs> yes, we know that the uh, augmented reality has um superimposed now in the digital transformation into the real world. For example, like today, we have the conference and we have on-site, and we have online, and we also have on-words. This is the first time that I saw that word. So like, I'm trying to go into the meeting as avatar, and it's look bad, because it just doesn't turn anything, and trying to make me dumb, and I don't know where to go. That is the fact, right? But it's, sometimes we, we are familiar with the things called entertainment. It's mean education plus entertainment, which is, I think, AR and VR trying to give that sense to us. And um, AR itself does like um, revolutionize learning by creating some immersive object. And it's interactive with us from somewhere, right? So that it gives us an exciting experience and it's helped virtualize some of the complex concepts that we couldn't just understand. I'm gonna show you some video later just about it, how hard that we can um, you know, like difficult to understand something, but it's made easier by using ADR. And it provides them feedback and personal light learning opportunity. Yes, it's also a first step right now. We are a lot more to go, but let's see how far we can go. Because I just talked with uh, our chair, Dr. Tep Chai, that I, I saw yesterday the car, just like we have a flying car right now. It looks like a drone, but the bigger one with the two uh, passengers. And I'm just flashing me back into the movie called 
um, Back to the Futures that they used to gather at the forum and to make the, the car fly. It has come at the present today, it's real already. So how effective that is used for the learning for the AR? And this photo I created from AR. Yes, yeah, freeze, and it's now it's been announced that there's no copyright for the, you know, like <laughs> the, the the so so we now hurry to generate it, you know, like as much as we can because it's still you know like no copyright right now, but you don't know for the futures, and uh, the effective of the AR depend on the the material that what we want to teach the student, right? And it, it can integrate the world uh, the virtual objects into the visual learning scene that. You know that where you are, you still at that moment, but it's something immersed from somewhere with your device, like tablet or phones. So it can be support through constructive knowledge, and it's self-sufficient. So you can learn anytime, anywhere, and you want to stop, you can stop, and you want to go back and learn this again. It's just like it with you, the wife it's with you. So it's a set in science and mathematics and history subject. Okay, and will be science experience can enhance. A lot of outcome. Yep. So this is uh, for the people that probably have some confusion that what is a VR, what is AR, or what is a mix, or a mixed reality, and we call it MR. So it's easily explained like virtual reality, you're wearing a helmet, you have a grip, and you just go somewhere else when you're wearing all of this device, and you don't know where you are, like the, in the movie Johnny English, right? Just calling to the street and don't know what, where 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 he is anymore. But in augmented reality, you still see in, in the person environment, but it's something immersed in your life, like Pokemon or some movie star into some applications. What do you want to see? But mixed reality, for example, you look in this photo, you still be that room and that moment, but you wearing some of the device. So you see a little bit more of the object emerging. It's more than AR. It's made more real in the sense of reality. Okay. So and, and VR itself can also enhance the learning, like immersive learning, increase engagement, motivations, visualization, some complex things that I already told you to make it easier to understand and retentions. Uh, like our previous speaker talking about the AI card that still help you have skin after a lot of retentions and the simulation like we see from uh, you know the early afternoon presenter that they, she used the simulation to, um, to simulate scenario that we cannot be at that factory or that laboratory but you can see it's from VR and uh, accessibility offer a diverse style and ability anywhere anytime and it's great motivation and engagement, and it, of course, it's fun, right? So, this is what I'm trying to get you into the moment that how lucky this student will be. This is student in the Random House School in Berkshire, England. So, uh, I want to show you this. Oh, hmm. So, it is connected with the internet, right? I know how to just like, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm going to try to explain to you. <coughs> this student have a class called the Metaverse class. They have up this device, just like the helmet, and also the grip and their hands. And they can be the avatar, and learn with dinosaur memoirs, and they can learn with the planet all around them. And they also learn to know how to be hard working by walking into the body. I think you guys can imagine that. And it's a it's the best experience for the student to know that some student has an interview with in, in, in this video that um, they are surprising because it's impossible for them to see black or some kind of real heart. But when when come to the technology, they see the blood flow in the heart, and the heart is quite big in large like this size so they easily remember and get a lot of retention on that um, that knowledge yeah. 
sorry for not working video. I think you guys can imagine that. So successful story had a lot of it, especially in the medical field, and especially in the pandemic. The doctor couldn't just traveling to, you know, like in the suburb area. So this one can help a lot about the being using AR to during the surgery, overlay subject can help um, giving the essential information of the, that particular patient and help a lot of um, adding to the doctor that doing a surgery that have some of the knowledge about that particular patient. And we are at this point in the flight simulator. We already know that it's used in the cockpit simulation many years already. It's still success and it's still be the only way to just not forcing the pilot to fly the plane, <laughs> the real plane in, in, you know, like not, not supposed to do it yet, but uh, in the simulation room is fine, right? And in history class, it's, uh, for example, like a student in, Ham, uh, in Berkshire, they're learning about the memoirs, the dinosaur, as we are. So they're standing and look at the sight of the animals in the histories and also with the, I saw once the, the VR simulation of a mummy in Egypt, something like that. You, you can see through the, I would say the shell of this layer of the mummy through the, the core, the bones of the mummy without you know, like seeing it yourself what you're seeing as a VR. And it's used for architectural design, it's for it. Especially in gear, like you want to put some chairs, some table in the room, in the particular side that you like, you just see, oh, it's how it fit, oh, it's just okay. And I have one of my colleagues, he's doing a project with Toyota, the car company. It's like in the room like this, it's an empty room, and when you uh, put your phone there and download the application, the Toyota car is going to appear right in front of you, but in your phone. You know? So you're going to see how. It's look like how big the color and you can just walk around that car to see that do you like it or not and you can see the real car at the you know like branch or the sale office so that is um the area that we want to have the further explorations like long-term health effect that we um, need to consider it and be concerned about it understand the prolonged hour of using of this is quite uh, dangerous and also interaction and uh, ability of the computer that we can use of it. I mean, if you use this in a prolonged hour, it's not going to be good for your health. In gradual, like in the photo, like that, the shoulder, the neck, and everything going to be causing. If when I'm teaching the student, I'm just forcing them to just stand up and just have a little exercise for one minute, something like that, because they're going to look at the phone, and we all do, right? And that is what some concern. And I'm also writing a paper called uh, Using a Gaming as a, as Capism, okay, talking about the gamification. Because um, some people have the troublesome in their life and they want to escape from the real world. So they're comfortable to play some game and it became addicted and blah, blah, blah. So I'm writing a paper of that as well. Very interesting. And also, the ethical and social implication concern that are now AI became more than what we expect in every form. Human noise, chat GPT. I if, if you bored, you can go and fight with it. It's very fun. I used to fight with the uh, chat GPT. I I, I want to know how to respond if I be a very angry person. How that chat GPT is going to be respond to me, and it's calming down. It's surprisingly, it's like it's better than talking with the people, you know, because the people when we get mad at you, you get mad at them, right? But chat GPT is very calm and very kind and very understanding. <laughs> so, so that's kind of some raising some of the ethics issues. A lot of ethics issues causing like, um, it's not about AI, VI, you know, but I'm just want to talk about it. Is have a case that they they hiring the extra the extra actor in the Hollywood one ex, one extra people and they manipulate the face into like hundred characters and it's wrong 
because you used to hire 100 people to do the job, but now you hire only one, and you manipulate the face into 100, you know, like characters. That is, it can be ethical issue as well. And one of my friend, friend of friends, actually, she working in Japan, and she used to drawing a photo for the company for seven years, seven years. And then the company didn't inform her, but put all of her work into AI and let it learn. Learn the line, learn the pattern. And then it became, she's been fine because they don't need her anymore. It's really sad, it's a real story. It just happened last month. She's tired, but working in Japan. And now it's became like, because you, they said that AI generated, so now it's nothing wrong with it. But behind that, that they put the you know the pattern of the the drawing, her drawing, is is totally wrong. So it's going to be a lot more of this ethical issue, you know, like with all the technologies and the cost is lower and lower, possibility is higher, so everyone can be can own and use this kind of technology. So what the warning and the concern is the, yes, it's offered the exciting opportunity and the raising a lot of idea and you need to be careful about the health and safety issue and addiction if you use it for you know long hours and privacy and security. Okay. And um, also the ethical the cost and accuracy and reliability that you need to be concerned with. The conclusion is about the modern information and technology impact everything, and especially teaching and learning. AR and VR are offered the practical and mature tool for education, and as a positive impact, a lot of positive impact on, on various disciplines, and major developments, and also the future creativity tools can significant important for the learning. That is the key of this conference and the potential to uh, revolutionize learning experience is going to be a lot more in the future. So thank you for being patient with me. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, yep. thank you so much. It's very nice. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Sure. I would like to know the trend about VR and AI in Thailand. Oh my god, you need to ask this guy. <laughs> He's the president of the AI societies of Thailand. So he's the video one that answered it, not me. Yeah, but in terms of academics, I would say it's not it's going, but the content is the key. We don't have anyone to provide the content much. Because the technology is easy. Like my friend can create application in in you know like create AR and VR not difficult, but the contents, yeah, the contents for academics. It's quite expensive also. No, not that expensive. In, in commercial, probably, but in terms of the academics, not. Because it's not difficult to create. It's like in higher education in Thailand. We don't see much. We don't see much. We don't see much. For example, we see in the school in London. We don't have it in Thailand. Yes. I, I think for the mass, I think it should be the future. But uh, I feel like uh, it cannot uh, be available in terms of mass. Because uh, I think uh, the problem of infrastructure is not good enough. Especially when you want to do like a 3D, mm -hmm. then it's much more difficult. You, you, you cannot put like a 50 people at the same room to do uh, ARVR at the same, uh, at the same time. That's it's quite difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, should be at the next trend. Uh, we have to uh, wait. Some, some other 
uh, field of education, mm -hmm. like uh, more kind of uh, social, uh, how can I say it, uh, uh, yeah, so it's kind of social issues. Not complex like enough, yeah, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly. So how do you think about uh, you know, the educational goals, different educational goals, affects uh, real or you know, it's a be right now it's not not yet I think right now because as I this is we just talk because the, the content is the key and the, the people who create the content is up to them that how much how complex that they want to create it and you say it's not probably applicable because they just have the budget <laughs> So, you so know, even, even yeah, for the, any kind of uh, educational goal, that content is a key. Educational goal, um, I think it's it's variance, it's variance. But the the one that they want to emphasize is about the the history, about the science, about the mathematics. It's is more relevance and, and it's easier to to visualize the context. Of that particular, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I'm very interested. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your questions. I can add up a little bit uh, in some, in some, uh, like a, in some issue. For example, for example, in Thailand, we do not have like a, a big earthquake, then we cannot have the experience mm -hmm. like this. But uh, if we can have like, this kind of like a VR in order to uh, give the people that like, this experience, but uh, it will help you because uh, we cannot have a chance. You know, the goal that uh, to have some experience with uh, something that uh, we, we hardly have this kind of experience, but if it happened, it had a great impact. It may be one thing that is possible. Yes, yes. How about in Japan? Yeah, so how, how everyone is goal right now about the AR and VR? AR and not using VR in education. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, as uh, my colleague is uh, the not kind of virtual uh, campus, mm -hmm. the school is not uh, clear. Mm -hmm. clear. Just today, uh, we created a campus on a VR base, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know what's going on. Not quite similar. <laughs> mm -hmm. He said there's a big, uh, the, the university of his, uh, the campus of his Okay, thank you so much everyone and uh, good afternoon. So today I will present about my topic, uh, AHP OSEP based framework for evaluating and matching coding bootcamp career with industry opportunity. So this, this uh, I, I work with my professor, my advisor, with, uh, Dr. Sikhon and Dr. Lia. We are from the AAT. So our agenda will be like this. Uh, we will make the introduction first, and then I have the background and the criteria of the evaluation criteria of the AHP, 
and then I propose the framework, and then I have the conclusion. So let's focus first. Actually, this this part is about uh, my main area is about the uh, e-learning or MOOC, MOOC for the coding bootcamp. Maybe you are not uh, some some part some people that not familiar with the coding bootcamp. The coding bootcamp is something like the uh, you need to study for the uh, maybe three to four months for the full time or the full full time around the nine nine a.m. until the five p.m. full time and then. After you can it from the coding bootcamp, you can uh, you can be the programmer immediately. You will the, the bootcamp will help you to find a job. So I I I in my research it's, it's about uh, using the books in the coding bootcamp. So the coding bootcamp have some part that that uh, very, uh, different from the traditional e-learning. For example, the course are connected together, and then uh, the course maybe needs a more practical. For example, if you do the coding, you need to practice a lot in the online context. So it may be different in the some part. So, and mostly, the the most important is about the focusing on the job. The coding bootcamp is a everyone who want to study in, in this bootcamp, they always want to be the to find a job. So, and uh, for to finding the job. We also need to have the company who want to receive, who want to hire the, the people from, from this bootcamp. So before this, we we can evaluate the quality and of the of the graduate. But now, if we take into account about the how 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 company will match with the student, we will need to have some process to to evaluate more some framework to to determine more more. Uh, efficiency of the student. So we use the AHP, the analytical hierarchy process for the multiple criteria matching. Then the result that we will show that the, we will offer a well round view of the graduate skill for the better aligning them with the industry. So let's come to the background. The background of the, the life of the coding bootcamp nowadays, I think we have around the one hundred the coding bootcamp around the world. In the Thailand, we have around five or six coding bootcamp in Thailand. So this is uh, the new trend, the new trend, and uh, no no one need to have the bachelor and the uh, and the uh, master degree anymore. So it focus on the practical and the hand on learning, the practical and hand on learning. The the teacher in this bootcamp away from the the industry who have the real experience in the software development. And it has a short time frame for the to, to have the job. The we talk about the existing method to evaluate the student on the on the online on the book. Normally for the boot for the coding, we always evaluate the student using the coding assignment, maybe the technical interview, maybe the code review, or maybe the portfolio development to evaluate the student. Uh, but however, in this evaluation, it still lack of some kind of the participation of the of the company participation of the teacher or the or the teacher assistant. So this method only focus on only the individual performance and not not the team performance. Because in the software engineer, no one can work alone, right? So if we want to improve the quality of the student, we will need to have the Way to to evaluate a student in the team context also. So uh, AHP will be the, the main algorithm to use in this. It's introduced by Sati in the 1980. It's the multi criteria decision making technique. It's suitable for the evaluating complex problem with multiple criteria. Let me show the example of the AHP a little bit for maybe some some of you who do not know about it yet. So AHP will 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 be suitable if you want to have your criteria. First of all, this part if you want to choose a leader, choose a leader among the Tom, Dick, and Harry. So if you choose the leader for your company, you will have the multiple criteria. First of all, I if I am the CEO, I can have my criteria like this. But sometimes my my colleague who are the CTO or who are the 
in different mindset of me, they can so also have different criteria. For example, I will focus on the experience, but my colleague may be focus on the education and charisma. So in this AHP, it can help that uh, based on the decision maker, which criteria is is better for, for them to choose the, the correct or the suitable leader. In the same as if we apply to the to the company. Some company may focus on the teamwork, some company, some company may focus on the student individual individual uh, individual skill and some company may be focused on the student who, who can do the, the job completely. So this is the criteria that I use the literature review and I propose in this paper. The criteria this uh, criteria and then I will have the sub criteria for each criteria. The criteria for this is uh, the main criteria is the individual performance, the team performance, the gamification element, the assessment from educator and the assessment from the company. For this is the example of the different company may be looking for the different different criteria. For example, the first company, traditional company may focus on the individual performance, but the startup company may be focused on the teamwork and the real world project. So it's the, the, the result for this AHP will be different. The student who will match with the company will be different based on their criteria selection. Uh, this is the sub-criteria of, of each main criteria. The first one is the individual performance. I will include the coding assignment, technical interview, portfolio development, and also business and exam. The team performance, I will include the group project, uh, peer, peer evaluation and the team-based code review, and then the SCAM and Agile methodology. And the third one is the gamification element. I will have this sub criteria the point patch leadership board, and then the level and the challenge. Why I include this criteria is because if you want the student to have partic more participation in the online learning, we uh, the gamification is uh, one, one most effective way to have students have more participation. And the next one is the assessment from the teacher and they, and they have the formative assessment, summative assessment, observation from the student for the real-time assessment of skill and the peer feedback facilitation to encourage peer-to-peer -peer assessment. And the assessment from the company. In the last, this, this bootcamp will last for the three months. For the, for the third month, uh, students need to, to work in the project with the company. So the company can evaluate the student in this sub criteria, the real world project performance, the industry feedback, collaboration and communication skill, and the post bootcamp employment opportunity. Okay, this is the, the methodology that I will do. The first one I will set up the coding bootcamp, set up the, the learning material, in the, and the use is with the learning management system, and let the student enroll into the, 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 the bootcamp, and then let the student form the team together. You see that I have the team evaluation. So in this, in this, uh, in this bootcamp, students need to group together to work in each, in each subject. This bootcamp will have allowed 10 subjects. So in each subject, students need to be grouped together and work as a team. So it's, I will, and then we will use criteria one and criteria two. There are five criteria, right? The first one I will call criteria one, and the second one I will call the criteria two. The criteria one and two we will apply into the first to the twelve week. And it will be applied for all. And then the gamification and educator assessment criteria three, the gamification and criteria four, the TA and teacher will be consider this criteria and will evaluate the student in the third until the twelve week. And then we will collaborate with the industry, with the company to send the student to work in the project with the company. Then after the student finish the project, the, the company will evaluate the student using, using the criteria 5. And then after, after the process finished, after the, the coding would have finished, uh, the student will have the score for each criteria. And then uh, we will know that for the company 1, the student will have how many scores for the company two? The student will have how many scores, and then we, uh, the company will have the criteria to recruit the student without any uh, hesitation, and we will know that student will be matching with the uh, which company. So for the conclusion, 
in this in this uh, criteria, I think it's, it's the really the comprehensive and the innovative way of the student to evaluate the student in the online learning because we include the three, the gamification and also the participation from the teacher, TA and also the, the company. And for the future, we need also, I will set up the bootcamp maybe in the next two months to have the real student come up and then I will uh, use this system and then I will conclude it. So thank you so much for your participation and any question and comment. Okay, thank you so much. Then uh, do we have uh, any questions or comments? Yeah. Okay. Yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. First of all, you mentioned at the at the beginning that uh, you you were based on the in, in video. I guess that's why. But uh, in in the scenario, you include a group or something like that. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, this one I talk about the uh, I, I mean the, the current trend, the current literature uh, yes. most most of it are used maybe only the based on the only student. Mm -hmm. What my proposed idea we based on this five criteria. So it will use a different point of view to mm -hmm. to be really a student. Okay. That means uh, the evaluation criteria you will use both individual and uh, uh, the team. The team. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do we have like a the ratio between that or with this one should we have more uh, important uh, uh, factor? Uh, yes, it's based on the company, right? The company will be the one who decide. You see the AHP, right? The company can determine which criteria is the uh, most uh, better. Yes. Okay, then uh, each uh, criteria is based on the company. Yes. So then mean uh, that you have set, uh, different uh, uh, criteria. Yes. If you think about uh, the software, company need to fill in the what criteria they differ, and then if you can put it. Yes, because we focus on the job, job ready. Do you have any questions or comments? I'm not sure from the online, are there any questions or comments or not? And uh, this is a, uh, you plan to have this kind of work happen? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, and how, how, how many people that you plan to are in the world? I want to this should be the company eight hundred. Yes, correct. Uh, which camp, uh, how many company should be? Okay. This one is a low low cost boot camp, and I will open as a part time for the three months. So I think I can draw maybe around one thousand students if possible. So I need to to work with many many institute to promote it. Yes. And how how many uh, company that you plan to add in uh, this boot camp? Because you say that the criteria is based on the company. Right. Yes, correct. Uh, in, in my association, I also be the ATSI association, we only have maybe 200, 200 companies. So I will invite all of them. Yes? Uh, you have a lot about the extrinsic motivation. Yes. Uh, what is the gamification, writing, rewards that is very useful? Uh, but uh, do you plan also of keeping track of the intrinsic motivation of each participant to see how that? Changes their performance. Oh uh, yes, yes, yes. Actually, it's yes, yeah, it's not included in here. Yeah, I think it's also a good, very really good idea. Yeah, it would be interesting <laughs> just to see if it works. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> nice recommendation. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. Any more question comments? Please. Okay, if no, then I think uh, we can uh, conclude uh, this uh, uh, session. Then so, so we have photos. Oh, yes, very good. Uh, let's have photos photo together. Oh, okay. So, For we go outside and have a good fun. Then let's take a And shall we input the uh, uh, online participant too? Yeah, yes, yeah. 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 Yeah.